So the first element was this social movement that arose in the Arab world called the Arab Spring. And the tactic of taking a public space and refusing to leave until your demand was met. That was in February. And, and what happened is Mubarak actually was kicked out. So it, it worked. And as soon as it worked, it inspired more people around the world. Next, it went to Spain. The people of Spain got inspired. And they started to go into their squares. But what they did that was different is they started to hold general assemblies where they would use consensus-based decision-making and they would start to discuss complex issues. How do we resolve these complex issues together? And they tried to create new forms of democracy. That was called the 15 May movement and it spread all over, all over Spain. So what we, what we did at the time I was working for a Canadian magazine, what we did is we, we saw that there's this potential revolutionary moment building all over the world. And we took the, the, the model of Tahrir, of Egypt, and we combined it with Spain. And we said to people, hey, let's go down to Wall Street, which is the financial headquarters of America and also sort of the world where the stock market is. Let's go down to Wall Street. Let's stay there permanently until our demand is met. And let's hold a general assembly and come up with our demand, which we suggested should be to get money out of politics. Okay, because in America, maybe, maybe you don't realize this, but in America, they recently, uh, the high court recently ruled that corporations can give unlimited money of, to candidates. So whoever has the most money usually wins the election. So the key thing to realize, the first point, is that social movements are created by a contagious mood, a mood of fearlessness, and a new tactic. You combine a new mood with a new tactic, and suddenly people rush to join and they follow and the movement, and the movement grows substantially out of control. And what you'll see here on these pictures is the movement spreading to Germany. And it ended up, Occupy Wall Street ended up spreading to 82 countries in a thousand different encampments all over the world. The movement grew substantially very quickly, but in the end, the movement was defeated. Occupy, I call Occupy Wall Street a constructive failure because it taught us something about the nature of activism. We learned that it's not enough to just do disruptive behaviors. We believed that um, that by having these general assemblies that somehow we would gain political sovereignty, that they wouldn't be able to evict us, that we would be able to change the course of our governments. And we learned instead that that's not true. So what we need is a deeper and more comprehensive understanding of the nature of social change. And what I want to present to you is kind of a, a, a way of thinking about activism that I think will help you create social movements. Okay, so imagine a grid Okay, and there's one side, one spectrum from left to right is subjective, and the other side is objective. So this is the this is this means on the one side um, that forces are subjective, which is inside of human 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 control, human mind, or objective, outside of human control, outside of the human mind. Okay, so if you make a grid out of these points, it creates four different options that I think help people understand about activism. In the lower left-hand corner, which is the idea that, that activism is a subjective in process involving humans and a natural phenomenon involving the material world, we get the dominant notion of activism, which is voluntarism. This is the idea that we have to create actions, human actions are what create change. So to, in order to, to, to create change, you need large numbers of people doing synchronized behaviors like marching or occupying. This is perfectly exemplified by this photo, right? We were able to convince these thousands and thousands of people to go into the streets on a certain day with signs and start to make demands because we believe that that would create social change. So that's called voluntarism. But you know, there's another option. If you go onto the other lower right-hand side of the, of the grid, what if, what if revolution is actually a, a, a natural phenomenon but it doesn't involve humans? So this is, so think about this. There's been studies that have shown that revolutions actually happen when um, like food prices increase. Okay? So if, if food prices in reach a certain level, then revolutions are more likely to occur. So they're not, a, they're not a process that involves human agency. It's not necessary to get large numbers of people into the streets in order to create social change. Instead, you would just have to wait until food prices increase or there's an economic or political crisis. So that's a second way of thinking about it. So that's the kind of like theoretical um, basis that I want you to think about is how to think about activism from those four perspectives. It's not about, it, I think it's really important not to just pick one of the four, but instead to think about movements from all of the four perspectives. Um, so, so, the, so the idea would be how to, voluntarism, how to get people to do large, the, do synchronized behaviors. Structuralism, how to learn what kind of economic situation is, is um, beneficial for dramatic social change. 
subjectivism, which is the idea that how are we going to get people to suddenly change their ideas in mass? And then the, fir the fourth one, uh, theurgy, how are we going to use some sort of divine intervention or how do we, how do we um, use that more spiritual power? Protest has become something that is expected. It's just something that's part of the process of doing politics. Politicians know that there's going to be protests, so that when the protests happen, it doesn't matter. But as to your second question, you know, this idea that, well, if they had something to lose, I'm also a little bit skeptical of that interpretation. I think for, for me, it's more of a question of thinking, well, how do the protesters become the ones in power? How do we reorient back to the, the fundamental problem, which is we have something that we want, and how do we get it? You know, so for example, in Bali, you have this this land reclamation movement. You know, stop the reclamation, or stop the takeover of this land. Well, how do you get to be in a position where you can be the force who stops it? Because you're the ones who are in control of the decision. That, I think, is the fundamental question. It's a question of sovereignty, basically. Um, and so, I think you're right on to observe that people in power don't need to listen to protests. And I think that the next step then is to think, well, how do we become the ones in power? Thank you. Thank you.